Welcome to Keeping the World Company on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we'll talk about what is good immigration policy? What changes do we need in the U.S. and globally? Our co-host for the show is Tim Apicella. Our guests for the show are Gene Rosenfeld, independent scholar, and Manfred Henningsen, Emeritus Professor of Political Science at UH Manoa. Welcome to all of you. I want to uh, I want to read you guys a poem, if you don't mind. Um, and this this poem is to kind of you know set the stage, if you don't mind. Um, and I think it's important that we examine this poem. It's called the New Colossus, and it's longer than the essential language that has been made popular. It was written by Emma Lazarus, who lived from 1849 to 1887. This poem is on the base of the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. Not like the brazen giant of Greek fame, with conquering limbs astride from land to land, here at our sea-washed sunset gates shall stand a mighty woman with the torch whose flame is the imprisoned lighting and her name, Mother of Exiles. From her beacon hand glows worldwide welcome. Her mild eyes command the air-bridged harbor that twin cities frame. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she with silent lips. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. That always touches me. And it was a statement of America, a nation of immigrants. So, Gene, let me go to you first. What has changed? This was a statement of the way it was in, hmm, what, 1880 or so? Um, this is a statement that the Statue of Liberty from France, interesting, you know, portrays to all of us. But something has changed. That poem would fall on deaf ears today. What has changed? Some things have changed and some things have sadly not changed. What has not changed is the immigration of ethnic minorities into the larger U.S. population has never been easy. Uh, there was a Chinese Exclusion Act passed in California at the time that we built the railroads across the United States and we needed Chinese labor. But we didn't welcome the Chinese. We just wanted their labor. And we needed it which we do still do today, by the way. Um, so and we had people from Eastern Europe come mostly Jewish uh, to escape pogroms in the early part of the 20th century. And they came largely to the urban centers to work in sweatshops uh, and do what they could to make a life for themselves. Uh, but they weren't necessarily welcome. There was a lot of anti-Semitism that they experienced. Likewise, the Irish, fleeing the potato famine, who came in droves in the 19th century. And the people who came to the Midwest to farm from uh, Eastern Europe were not welcome. They were different. They spoke a different language. Their culture was different. Their religion was different. So to a certain extent, there has always been some xenophobia. That's very, very different from what we're experiencing today. This is more than xenophobia. We may not realize this, but for more than a century, there have been major population dislocations throughout the world. Remember, we had two of the greatest global wars in history in the 20th century, which displaced people. There were giant famines in China with, you know, a billion people, and this displaced people. People in Africa who have had periodic famines. Uh, individuals now coming 
from Latin America who are suffering through the drug cartels control over their small countries. For all of these reasons, and this will increase because of climate change, we're experiencing sudden large groups of people coming to our borders. Now, to a certain extent, this belies the propaganda about America being uh, the evil imperialist power in the world because when people are beating down your door to come in, it doesn't mean you're an evil imperialist power. It means you're a desired power. And we notice that the people who are calling us these names are facing an exodus or people are of people are having to wall their people in. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. What happened in the late 20th century was a very strong anti-immigrant movement, nativist movement in the United States, spearheaded by people who considered themselves descendants of the original settlers in the northern and southern colonies. And one of these people was Glenn Spencer, who started the American Border Patrol and had the first organization on the Arizona border. He was actually from California. He worked with FAIR, which was one of the early anti-immigrant groups in the late uh, 20th century. And he then influenced, he became very influential and, and, and more groups formed. These groups came out of the anti-government radical right of the 1990s and beginning in the 1970s with the Posse Comitatus. These were the ancestors of what we saw on January 6th with the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers and the Three Percenters and all of those people in Charlottesville. We, we've always had this underbelly and it's been very nativist. Uh, it's been very anti-immigrant. But now it's captured the emotions of the country and the politics of the country. We, like other postmodern Western powers, economic powers, are losing population. Uh, our settled population, our, our citizens are not actually repopulating uh, themselves. So we always need immigrants. Immigrants are the lifeblood of the United States. They always have been. But not in such numbers. And now it's become a political football because we have from this nucleus of posse comitatus, anti-government, white nationalist, quote unquote, patriotic, unreconstructed Southern mythologists who populate our radio waves and talk shows and things like that. Uh, we have uh, a movement that has captured the Republican Party and has become a mass populist movement. And this mass populist movement wants to retreat into the isolationism of our continental borders to uh, repel anyone who wants to enter also, who looks differently, speaks differently, and is not a descendant of these uh, favored uh, ethnicities. So no, we're not alone on this. We're not alone. No. And I want to ask Tim what the relationship is um, between this phenomenon you're describing, Gene, uh, and uh, something you mentioned, that it is climate change and the global south and people wanting to seek a better life. What's, what's the connection, Tim? And, and why is the connection so much more robust now than it was before? I hate to say it, but um, some of the strongest supporters of um, stringent um, immigration laws tend to be from immigrants. <clears throat> I'm thinking of Florida, uh, particularly in the Miami-Dade County area, um, certain pockets along the Texas border. And I, I don't know if it's a feeling that we got ours, but you can't have ours. We got in but you can't get in. And I, I, I don't know if that's hypocrisy at its best or it's just fear. And I think a lot of it is fear. I mean, I think uh, we have polit uh, demagogues like uh, Trump and uh, other politicians who raise fear for their own political gain. It's the fastest way to get elected is using the old immigration tactic 
uh, is certainly the fastest way for a, uh, a would-be dictator to gain a following is by creating fear and scapegoating immigrants. Uh, it's the oldest game trick book in the, in the world, but it works. And it's based uh, on fear and people's insecurity about um, what their neighbors look like, what jobs allegedly they're taking away from them. Um, there's only so many pieces of the pie available to a population. And by gosh, I want to make sure that we have enough for our, our family and our friends and our community. And we don't want people uh, getting their share. So um, I'm not sure that falls in place with uh, the Statue of Liberty uh, concepts and that poem you read. But there, there we are. That's kind of the climate we're in today. Yet we all know that we need employment. We need jobs filled. Uh, we all know that we are, we are immigrants. Um, my grandparents immigrated from Southern Europe. And uh, they did so for, out of economic necessity. But um, so we are what we used to call as a melting pot. I, I like to compare it to as a, a mixed salad bowl. But, uh, you know, we, we tend to forget our past, and it doesn't take many generations to figure out where we came from and try to recall that uh, we are a nation of immigrants. You know, Manfred, it, it, it's not only in the U.S., although the U.S. seems to be especially strident about it these days with Trump around, but, it, you know, this has happened in, in Europe, too. And we could have seen, for example, um, immigrants from the Middle East and North Africa would, would, if allowed into the countries of Europe, which were very proud of their cultural heritage, uh, that over time, this would be a problem. I remember meeting a Swedish student from Hawaii Pacific University. And I said, this is 10 years ago. And I said, how do you feel about immigrants coming to Sweden? She says, I'm, I'm really unhappy that Sweden hasn't allowed as many immigrants in as Germany. She said, I'm, I'm, I see Germany as the model for how we treat immigrants these days. And I'm sad that Sweden isn't as humanitarian as Germany is. So I would like to ask you, Manfred, you know, what the comparison is between the situation in Europe, not only Germany, but everywhere in Europe, uh, with regard to immigrants, migrants, and the U.S.? That's a hard question. Sweden is now offering migrants they want to get rid of $30,000 uh, as a premium. Uh, so they want to buy them out of uh, the country. But, uh, I mean, your, the Lazarus poem and uh, Jean's uh, talk have to be added. I mean, something has to be added that both of you did not emphasize. In addition you know, to the symbolism that surrounds the Statue of Liberty and the Lazarus poem, you have uh, the projects, I mean, you have 16, 400 years since 1619 when Africans and uh, Black Americans were not part of this mysterious story that you are celebrating. And uh, in a way you could say that is still uh, going on. So you have uh, institutionalized racism in the founding document uh, of the United States. Now, when you're going to Europe today, in Germany, you have uh, a right-wing party as in France, as in Holland, in Belgium, as in Italy. In Austria, <laughs> the FPO just won with anti-migrant uh, rhetoric. Uh, so, you have, uh, despite the reality that all three of you uh, alluded to, that you have declining native populations and they have to be, in a way, uh, enlarged by uh, migrant migrants, as the United States has shown for 250 or so years, uh, in Germany, I think at this point you have, uh, and I mentioned that uh, at uh, an earlier meeting, you have a large section of uh, the people living in Germany having migrant background. Uh, it's close to 17% by now. And the Swedish student that, uh, um, that uh, Tim mentioned, uh, it's, it's very interesting. 
is that the model, I mean, that she she envied Germany, I'm sure it was during the Merkel years, 2015, when Merkel did not want to close the borders and one million Syrians came into uh, Germany. Uh, but what is what is interesting about that situation that they have really been integrated in a remarkable way. But uh, today, I think the asylum seekers, one million per year, the two million Ukrainian refugees, and uh, you know, then regular immigrants have somehow begun to challenge the patience of people. It has not reached, it has not reached, I think, all of Germany, but the three elections that you had in the former uh, GDR, the communist part of Germany, are an indication, uh, you know, in, in, in those three states, the 30% or so level, that's the Austrian level also for the FPO, uh, indicates, you know, that there is uh, a lack of continuing support, even though they know all Germans know that all social and other institutions would collapse without this enlargement uh, of the native population. Now, remember, we are not only talking about Europe when we are talking on, in the United States. When you're looking at Japan, I think it's the worst scenario. Uh, the population in Japan is declining. Uh, they need migrants and they invite them, but they will not give them citizenship. Uh, so you have there a nativist racism being part of the Japanese identity that you have in parts of the United States, in parts of Europe, but it has not become the center ideological package in, in, in Germany so far. It may come that way, but it hasn't. So for that reason, I, I'm still somewhat optimistic that when you have elections last ne next year in Germany, national elections, the AfD, the alternative for Germany, will not become as successful as it has been now in the three state elections in a form of communist country, which have never been exposed, you know, to a lot of non-European looking people anyway, whereas in West, the Western part of Germany that was uh, occupied by the three Western powers, the US, Great Britain and France, uh, the, presen the presence of non-European uh, soldiers contributed and then uh, following uh, the developments, you know, you have a lot of um, Asian and especially African students uh, coming uh, to uh, Germany, for example, uh, it uh, in a way created an atmosphere of acceptance uh, that uh, is still prominent. Tim points out a very interesting phenomenon, and that is that um, each uh, each entry into a nation of immigrants wants to have its own seniority. And it will be prejudiced, bias against the next generation, the next group of immigrants. And, and that carries down. But, but you know, just to throw one thing in the pot, you're, you're exactly right about 1619 and the black phenomenon in the United States. They've always been at the bottom of the pot um, and still today, arguably, they still are. And, you know, we have a special problem. But it's right. always a matter of scapegoating. It's always a matter of finding the guy at the top and the guy at the bottom, and it's often based on, on race. Let me add one more point for Jim's consideration. And that is, uh, I was telling you earlier, Tim, that in, in Singapore, um, they recognize the problem with the bell curve. We apparently don't. We don't realize that we're down from fertility of 2.1 to 1.6, which is you know at maintenance or lower than maintenance of a population. Singapore will look at its population and say, gee, in order to staff this country, we need to bring in a million immigrants. 
we're going to do that tomorrow. And they do it with incentives and you know regulatory changes. So <clears throat> Japan ought to learn from Singapore, I would say. In any event, Tim, your reaction to all of this, this, this sequencing that we have in this country, especially. I'm reminded of 1987. We had the biggest immigration reform in the Reagan administration uh, that we had in, in, in decades. And it was a colossal reform. Um, who, who was the lead of that? That was the Republicans that wanted to see immigration reform and, and certain rules followed and certain stringent uh, requirements uh, to be adhered to. Guess who broke most of those laws? Were employers <laughs> and the CEOs were, or the owners were Republicans. Why did they break the law? They hired um, undocumented uh, immigrants because they needed the labor. Their businesses were going to go under. And so they consciously and, and did not verify uh, um, citizenship status before they were hired. And uh, we've been in that track ever since 1987. So there's an acknowledgement that there is a genuine need for immigrants to come in and, and fill employment, just like Japan is having that issue. Manfred's spot on. Japan's one of the worst. Uh, they're trying to encourage more marriage and more child uh, childbirths um, with their own, but they'll never catch up to what to what they need to uh, man a workforce. So you know you're you're looking at Singapore as trying to take a um, a pragmatic approach to their labor shortages, and, and so I'm just reminded of the fact that we say one thing, but we're willing to break the law when no one's looking, and I don't <laughs> think that'll be any different. If we have major uh, immigration reform in 2025, we'll be right where we were in 1987. And it's, you know, we have to acknowledge that we're not anti-immigrant. I mean, Donald Trump said it perfectly. He said, I welcome immigration. I welcome immigration from Sweden and Norway. Right. Uh, but he, and to use the term, I'm not interested in those shithole countries. Okay, meaning what? Non-white countries. Um, Africa, South America, those countries. He's not, he's not interested in immigration from those nations, but the pure white nations. Um, that's a white supremac supremacist in my world. So Gene, you know what we can learn from Europe <clears throat> to the extent we have observed Europe, uh, gee whiz, for a long time. And this problem has existed in one form or another in Europe, you know, scapegoating, for example, even of your own citizens. Um, and from you know, looking at the diverse cultures that we have today, like it or not, this is a very diverse country. And look at the media, it's completely salad. It's salad, that's what it is. So <clears throat> Gene, um, a friend of mine worked for the House Committee on Immigration. He was a lawyer. He was dedicated to writing immigration reform. And I guess this happened after 1987. None of the immigration reform bills ever got through. Um, Congress has been completely paralyzed on the issue, as the country has been paralyzed on the issue. I, I will never forget, they asked the Immigration Service at one point in time, do you have a list of all the people who are in the country, you know, as holders of visas of one kind or another, who are not citizens? And the Immigration Service had no idea. They had no list. With AI and database management, certainly we can do better. My question to you is, and this is it's the name question of this discussion, is what kind of policies should we be considering now to improve not only the way our country works, the way our economy works, the way our city on the hill image used to work, what policies should we consider? When we speak about immigration, because it's such a political football, everybody engages in what is called glittering generalities. There is no one description of immigration that fits all immigrants, legal or illegal. Being from California and witnessing this, and knowing this way back when I was in college, even on a field trip, we visited um, workers 
agricultural workers that were brought in from Mexico on contract. This was the so-called Bracero program, Bracero meaning worker in Spanish. And it was a common thing because also most people don't know this, California is the premier agricultural um, state in the United States. It produces more food than any other place in the United States in the great Central Valley. And we needed those braceros. And because California originally was part of Mexico, and because those Californians helped John C. Fremont um, bring California into the United States, uh, we have a culture of hundreds of years of people just ignoring the border, enjoying going back and forth from their villages in Mexico to their work in the United States. And it has worked very well. If we could use that as a template for immigration here in the United States, and we were to change our attitude toward immigrants, that would be a great thing. I personally and my family have hosted and subsidized and, and basically supported two different women, one who came from Central America, well, both came from Central America from very different countries. They are now matriarchs in American families of three and four generations who have been immensely successful and have gone to Ivy League colleges. So this tells you a different story from what you're hearing in politics. Not it's only that, but we took in a young man for five years into our home who then became a college scholarship student and now is a fantastic teacher, master teacher in New York City and graduated from an Eastern University. Geez, that's so an interesting you, point. It's I can a, tell you that- Wait, 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 wait man, for the, let Jean finish. The, the stories you're getting are false. California, and I think probably Kamala Harris knows this, has had a lot more experience with immigrants. Yes, we have depopulation. We need, first of all, as she says in her campaign, we need the bill that was on the table that increased border security, paid more, and hired more border agents. It was very interesting what Jean said about California having been part of Mexico, and that you have this close connection bet beyond the borders between those two parts on the North American continent. Now, this model that she recommends for <laughs> introduction as a general model was part and is to some extent still part of the European Union. You have these 27 states uh, with open borders. You, uh, people can move from one place to another uh, to work. But you see, then came Brexit. And the people that got rid, that the British got rid of uh, through Brexit were mostly Europeans, not migrants you know, from other parts of the world. Uh, so in a way, the European Union practices this model that Jean uh, <laughs> described, you know, for the Texan, for the Californian, uh, well, you could Arizona and New Mexico, you could add to that. They were also part of Mexico. Uh, you had this model, and then you have these uh, purists, these ethnic and cultural purists, uh, in uh, Great Britain, not in Scotland, in, in England, who felt uh, alienated by these Bulgarians, these Poles, these Hungarians, Romanians. Uh, they encountered in restaurants, in, in hospitals, in all kinds of places, sure. and they wanted to get, they got rid of them. And what you have now is a country, Great Britain, that uh, regrets the Brexit. It was regrettable, but let me let me uh, tell you that when I graduated law school, I went on my grand tour, and I went to uh, I went to France. And I decided, I, uh, at the suggestion of the ticket agent in the station, um, Dorsey it was, uh, Gar Gar Dorsey. Right. I decided I would go to Madrid. It's now a museum, you know, and now it's then it was a train station. And um, I went to Madrid and I ran into a guy who spoke French, but not English. And I didn't speak Spanish, 
But the story was that he was migrant labor. So from Spain to France, 1965, people were doing migrant labor. And the French felt good about that, and so did the Spaniards. And you know, your point about um, Mexico really touches me because we have such a tremendous connection with Mexico. It's like the it's like the, uh, the European Union of the US and Mexico. <laughs> That's what it's like. So you say, well, we have a special affinity for Mexico. So I'm, I'm asking you, Manfred, whether isn't it a good idea to say, look, if we have a geographical affinity, such as the EU, such as the relationship between Spain and France then and now, uh, why don't we just give them priority? And if they're coming from far, far away from cultures that we don't understand, that we are worried about, then they get second position. But the first position would be the countries in the entity of the European Union. Wouldn't that be a good place to start? Why don't we do that with Mexico? <clears throat> Your proposal uh, for the EU would mean that uh, they depopulate each other. So your proposal doesn't really help the issue of depopulation of most European countries. Uh, they need migrants coming from other parts of the world. Uh, and uh, for that reason, you know, I think the Mexican model uh, works only temporarily and, and Great Britain sh has shown that they didn't even accept that. Uh, and they got rid of all of the European uh, workers that helped them to run their country. Now you have, I think there's one other dimension that one has to mention when talking about the prejudices against mig migrants. And I think it's not only race, even though it is obvious sometimes as a factor, but it's also culture, including religion. And when you uh, listen to the racist uh, propaganda coming, Putin is on top of that. But Orban and, uh, and, and other people in the Czech Republic and in other places of Eastern Europe, but also in, in, in Italy, in, in, in Austria and in France, they talk not only about uh, the colorization of Europe, they talk about the deculturalization, meaning uh, getting rid of Christians, getting rid of uh, uh, European culture. So what you have there is a package that these uh, racists led by Putin uh, propose uh, in order to restore law and order and propriety, uh, ethnic propriety, European identity. I think that's a great point. And there's an intersection here uh, between immigration and politics. We've touched on that. And also immigration and autocracy as a, as, a, right. as yes. one element of politics. So, Tim, your, your thoughts, can you start putting this together because we're running out of time? Well, you asked Gene a question and, you know, I've been going over and over in my mind, and that is what, what you know, what, what should we put in place um, to address immigration? And, and, you know, this bill that was proposed that was waved off by Donald Trump, um, I think it was a bill that Democrats really didn't want to support but they knew they were taking it on the chin um, by popularity. I think uh, Democrats and, and Republicans want to see immigration reform. And I think, uh, remember, on a historical basis, that bill went forward as a direct result of the GOP not willing to fund the Ukraine war effort. Right. It was a quid, uh, quid pro quo. And um, this was a very stringent bill. It was very conservative. It provided... Um, huge increase to border security, but more importantly, or equally importantly, was that there was going to be judges, uh, hundreds and hundreds of judges uh, designed to adjudicate uh, asylum cases down at the border. So these, these, these cases would take weeks to resolve, not years. And as we know that most asylum seekers, 95% are not approved, 5% or less uh, are approved for uh, valid asylum cases. And so it had that 
element to it. Now, I, I agree that there needs to be more judges to look at this, these asylum cases on a, a speedy basis. Um, it also had, of course, um, technology that was um, to be employed, drones and drone surveillance, not just personnel. It had uh, elements of um, anti-fentanyl, anti-drug um, cartels coming across. So it had a little bit for everyone. And believe it or not, the most uh, conservative Republicans certainly did support that bill, except for one person, two people, uh, Donald Trump and Mike Johnson, Speaker of the House. Gene, um, let's revisit the question. What can we do? What should we do? You know, this is a very hard problem because it connects with so many other problems. It connects with you know the political viability of democracy, among other things. Um, if if you were the president, I'd like to make you president just for a day. Um, <laughs> she's <laughs> become what, what four years. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> Ouch. I like watching Madam Secretary, but I don't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> what what kind of, you know, how do you solve this problem? Because what I get from this discussion is in large part, it is insoluble. No, you, you go about it rationally, no matter what craziness is going on in politics. Number one, um, immigration numbers are slightly down. Uh, we don't have control over the chaos in other countries. I mean, it's ridiculous to think that we do. Um, thirdly, uh, we have to understand one thing. We don't have the numbers we need to maintain our superiority in the economic world as a country. We need to bring in people. And that's not the story you're hearing. You're hearing the opposite. And so these people are self-selected, so we get those with greater initiative and greater drive, believe it or not. That's how we built a country. The thing we have to recognize is this. We're not gonna be overpopulated by them because the single driver of birth, numbers of birth, is urbanization. When people come into a modern economy, it's so expensive, they can't afford to have 12 kids anymore. And they want one or two children and they don't feel insecure because they have good medical care and they know those kids are going to survive. So immediately in the first or second generation, you get an immediate drop in numbers among the immigrant populations, except in certain, you know, religious um, places where, for example, uh, women are still under the patriarchal thumb and they're just told to, you know, breed, basically. But that's not the general thing. So number one, they're not gonna overpopulate the country. And it's so funny to hear J.D. Vance say that they are the problem with not enough housing in the United States. That was it's ridiculous. By, by the time anybody in the United States can afford to buy a home, they're already contributing tax and they're contributing a lot to our economy and they're not a problem anymore. And that's actually, second and third generation immigrants are doing very, very well. Their children are doing better in school. And this is why you see the at the top of the heap in these good universities, you're seeing a more diverse population of people. You go to any general hospital in any major city, your doctors are not going to look like people from Georgia or Massachusetts. Uh, or the Midwest or Iowa, they're gonna look like the world. Yeah. And so the problem is gonna solve itself if we simply have the tools in place for the program of admitting people. We have rational laws that govern that and we don't get objections from grandstanders like Greg Abbott of Texas showing that the federal government is no good and we should elect Trumpers. So uh, political. we just have to be rational in the way we do this. We have to get that bill going and we have to teach. There's two huge impediments, Manfred. I like your thoughts on it. One is you have to pass that bill. You have to, you have to you know, create the bill, fashion the bill, and pass it. The second one is you have to manage it. You have to enforce it. And we've had some discussion about how Mm, the government has trouble enforcing these 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 rules, these laws, uh, on the border or otherwise. 
Um, and if you want to avoid you know, the problems we have had, you've got to manage the legislation that you passed. Your thoughts on that? And this is your closing statement, Manfred. So add anything else you want. In the 1960s, when I was studying in Munich, it was very interesting, you know, when we as students would go out to restaurants, the restaurants we went to were Yugoslav, I mean, today, Croatian or Serbian or Slovenian. They were Italian. They were Greek. They were French. Uh, German cities became really cosmopolitan through the in migration of people from uh, southern Italy and other places, and, and Turkey certainly also, uh, to open restaurants. And that culture exists still today. I mean, these Italians, these uh, Greeks, these Yugoslavs, these Turks that came in the 60s have never left. They created families. You know, the Turkish population in Germany today is uh, more than 5 million. Half of them are citizens uh, because uh, they applied where the rest didn't want to lose their property in, in Turkey. So what you have was really before the unification of Germany in 1990, uh, a really extraordinary successful uh, economic and social integration of migrants from all parts of Europe. And you have, I mean, you also have, when you are talking about Europe, you have to distinguish between the two parts, the part that was in a way educated, politically educated by the West, by the US, by Britain, France, and the East that was not educated, but simply dominated by the Soviet Union. And all the countries, that were part of the Soviet bloc uh, before the collapse of the Soviet Union are suffering from this right-wing uh, fascist uh, nationalism uh, that is driving uh, me, when I listen to these people, it drives me nuts. And then you have, you know, in, in Germany now, you have the right-wing and the left-wing, two parties that won uh, strongly in these three elections, they are all uh, formed by the Soviet occupation policies. They love Putin's auto autocracy. I think Jean talked about that uh, a little bit earlier, that one has to uh, really bring in this longing for the strong man, you know, this virility, fascination <laughs> that is connected with the naked uh, Putin on the horse. Uh, it's a wonderful symbol, you know, for, for, the, <laughs> for the autocracy symbolism. Uh, so I think uh, I am not, I mean, I'm not proposing anything for the United States. Uh, I don't know how better to manage the bills that have to be passed and haven't been passed. Uh, you need, I think, uh, a democratic regime, a democratic party uh, to, to do that because the conservatives, the Republicans, are incapable of managing this issue. Okay, let's leave it there. Tim, uh, your closing thoughts, final thoughts on this? Uh, closing thoughts are the following. Um, immigrants are often used as scapegoats by politicians, community members that are you know, filled with fear. Uh, look at the Rust Belt, look at the South. Um, immigrants are being blamed for massive unemployment, uh, taking jobs away from people that have lived there for generations. And in fact, those low paying jobs were offshore to places, uh, you know, other places in the world. Um, that was part of it. But a bigger part of it, I think, is automation. And automation is the answer to the fact that we have a low labor force for, for activities and work that, you know, multi generation uh, Americans don't want to do. And so we're seeing a huge automation push for automation. That's going to create more problems than certainly any immigration issue will ever cause. And yeah. second point is this. Second point is this. You go to a swearing in a ceremony for citizenship, you'll find no greater patriot of the United States than a newly uh, welcomed American citizen. 
you'll find no one who knows more about civics, the Constitution, and the rule of law than a newly invited and welcomed immigrant. Yes, true. Thank you. Gene, now you. Let me remind you, by the way, um, that the dock strike, okay, is um, on the yes, East automation. Coast, not the West Coast. And the reason is the West Coast is already automated, but the East Coast is not. Oh. And the dock workers are very concerned that what, ha what has happened on the West Coast will happen to them. In other words, that automation will come East. That's why the strike. Right. I find that so interesting in view of Tim's comment. Anyway, um, your final thoughts. Well, I think automation is going to happen whether we have people beating down our fences to come into the United States or not. But the thing to remember is that most of what you hear in debates between candidates on the question of immigration is false. Immigrants uh, do not threaten our crime rate. They do not threaten our economy. They do not take the jobs that Americans want. Uh, who wants to slaughter chickens 10 hours a day in sweatshop conditions? Um, they never have. They follow the same pattern as the immigrants of the past that we now, you know, that have now contributed presidents to us, including the Kennedy family. They were treated just the same way and viewed the same way. There is a natural human resistance to people who don't belong to your identity group. This is worldwide. It has nothing to do just with the United States. What has to do with the United States is that everybody wants to come here. And what we need is a better, smoother, more efficient processing of the people who are coming here. We certainly do need to weed out those that are not going to contribute and who have, there are reasons for them not to. But the young man that we hosted in our home for five years, who got a full scholarship to Middlebury College when he was still illegal, and Middlebury let him off for a year so he could become legal. He came over as a five-year-old with his grandmother. He didn't choose to come for, to, to escape war in El Salvador. And Marco Rubio and the Latinos in Florida who were Cubanos were of a different, completely different group than the Salvadorans who were never really welcomed. The Cubanos were welcomed because they were anti-communist. We have to remember this. And Rubio's bill in 1987, it didn't privilege the kids that were escaping war in El Salvador. It privileged the Cubanos in Florida. So we have to look at this in a micro way and make provision for them. This young man is contributing to our society. He is a master teacher, and he's gotten his master's degree in teaching in New York City, where he is teaching immigrants from Africa initially, and now is teaching science as well. He never had a science background, but he's so bright, he can do it. So these are the stories we need to tell. We need to personalize and make these stories replace the notion of shithole countries and Haitians uh, and uh, you know the trafficking of persons. Those things are going to happen. The trafficking of persons are going to happen regardless of our immigration policy. It has nothing to do with the immigrant population. Well, that's a, let me add that uh, in the 1880s, when Emma Lazarus wrote the poem, and the operative lines are, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. It was life and death. The ones who came lived. The ones who couldn't come Maybe they didn't live. I am sure that I have relatives who died in the process. And so we have to see this as a life and death issue for those people. It's not just that they can get a good job and raise a family. They can survive. And that's what immigration offers to so many people. Well, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean Rosenfeld. Thank you, Tim Apicella. Thank you, Manfred Henningsen. It's been a very important discussion. I appreciate all your contributions. Aloha. Mm -hmm.